Greetings everybody, my name's Adam Draycott and you are watching the online ministry for St Augustine's Anglican Church here in Inverell. Uh, this has been prepared for the 13th of June 2021 and our sentence of scripture comes from Psalm 27. It says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Cast me not off, forsake me not. God of my salvation. Let us pray. Almighty God, our hope and strength, without you we falter. Help us to follow Christ and to live according to your will. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the ministry of God's Word, our preaching... As we come to the ministry of God's Word, our Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, Psalm 92, and our preaching passage is Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Please take a moment to pause uh, this video and uh, read through uh, those passages of Scripture, especially Romans. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you that we can open up your word, that we can uh, spend time in the book of Romans. Again, we ask you to show us the glory and wonder that is your son, Jesus, and lead us, please, in the way of faith and repentance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past few weeks, we've been in Romans. We've really focused on verse 14 of chapter 6 which says that sin shall not be your master because you're not under the law, you're under grace. 
And so questions have been raised, does sin matter? If I'm under grace but not under law, should I care? And the answer, again, is by no means. Of course we care, of course sin matters. But our question today is a little different. What do we do with the law? All that is true if we're under grace but not under the law. What do we do with the law? What place does it have in the Christian life? In chapter 6, we've met some pictures to help us as we've wrestled with these questions. The first picture, if you remember, was early in Romans chapter 6. We had a picture of death. Just as surely as Christ died and was buried and rose again, so did you. You died to sin on the cross. You were joined to Christ at that moment. The second picture was the master-slave relationship in verses 15 to 23. That was the next picture. Slavery to sin, where the take-home packet is, or the wages of sin is death, or the alternative, you want to be free to serve God in Christ and belong to him while eternal life is the gift. So those pictures again, what were they? One was death, the other was slavery. We're joined to Christ in both. What on earth could be the third picture? What's today's picture? It's marriage. Which is really some trilogy, isn't it? Death, slavery, chapter 7, marriage. <laughs> Let's look at verse 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, a law, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and, and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Boom, you are only married for as long as you are married, till death do us part, right? We all know that to be true, till death do us part. The wife is only bound to her husband as long as he is alive. We know that. If he dies, then she is released from her obligations to her husband. But while he's alive, well, you can't run off and shack up with another person. That is just not on. But if her husband does die, then she is free of him and free of the obligations that previously bound her to him. Now, this might be a trigger for some of you. It might trigger emotions if you've lost a loved one. I'm sorry about that. But I want you to see the picture for what it is. Here is the point. Just like the wife who in the death of her husband is freed of her obligations to her husband. Verse 4, So you, you also died to the law. When did I do that? Through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. On the cross, you died to the law. It's over. And you now belong to Christ. You are free to belong to Christ. And so the law is like a husband that you once belonged to. And what fruit did we reap in this relationship with my husband, the law? Well, verse 5, it says you reap sin and death. That doesn't sound like a great relationship, does it? Sounds like the law is the kind of husband that brings out the worst in you. Well, hold that thought. For whatever the case... The point Paul is making is the relationship is over. You are now free to belong to another. 
For in Christ that past relationship is dead and buried. Uh, Verse 5. For when you are in the realm of flesh, the realm of flesh is our sinful state, which is um, contrast the spiritual. Uh, When you're in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we've been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Again, by dying to the law, the believer is legitimately free to marry again, and that is to be united with Christ, to belong to him and thus serve in the new way of the Spirit. Serving in the new way of the Spirit, I know that's what you want to talk about right now, but we're going to um, talk more about that in, in when we get to chapter 8. Because we're dealing with the question at the moment, what then is our relationship to the law? What do we do with the law? Do we fear the law like the legalist does? Do we hate the law like it's the law's fault, like the law is the problem? Is this what we do? If the law brings out the worst in me, it must be to blame. Answer? Rubbish. (laughs) No, we'd actually love the law. What? Why? Well, because it represents the will of God. Simple. It comes from God. You can't hate. You can't hate the law when it comes from God. That doesn't make any sense. It represents the will of God. So we love it, right? Why else do we love it? Because Jesus fulfills it. It points us to Jesus and what he's done for us. And look at verse 12. Paul says that the law is holy. The law is righteous. You want to know what righteousness is? The law is holy and righteous and it is good. Oh, okay. So does the law save me? No. No, it doesn't save you. But see the thing here, the problem isn't the law because the law is like the measuring stick or like the thermometer. You stick it in your mouth and it tells you there's a problem. But the problem is not the thermometer. The thermometer is just the measure. And here, the problem is not the law, the problem is sin. That's what's wrong with us. And so we need to understand the relationship. If one's husband is the law, then every time I look in his eyes, I see my guilt and my sin. The problem isn't the law, the problem is my sin. All the law does is tell me what it is. It articulates it. Look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. See? For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Do we know what coveting is? To covet is to want something really badly that belongs to someone else. I want it. I want it now. I want it all. I want it. Anyway, coveting is about discontent and self-love. That's at the root. Um, accumulating massive debt might be a sign that you're, you're guilty of covetedness. Spending beyond our means to keep up with the Joneses because I want what they have. Fear of missing out, that kind of thing. Social media, of course, is the epicentre of covetedness or criticism when people are critical when people rubbish others coveting can be behind it they maybe they're just critical because they're jealous or maybe has everybody had a conversation with a child that wants a toy example a ds yep and uh, it's just not me and this can be coveting coveting is when you want something so bad You make life miserable for everybody else. But maybe you never knew what it was until it was spelled out for you. As I am told, oh, that's, yeah, that's a problem. And that, right, that's sin. And verse 7, now I see it. And uh, as I see my sin, I see my separation from God. I see my love of self and not my love for God. And do we blame the law for that? No, of course not. No, that's my sin. And sin undermines 
this relationship. Uh, sin is an unwelcome third party in our relationship to the law. Let me say that again. Sin is an unwelcome third party. It's a voice in our relationship to the law. If you want to keep going with the marriage analogy here, I can. I mean, maybe sin then is akin to one's mother-in-law. That might sound shocking to you, especially if you think I'm talking about my mother-in-law. Man, that would get me in a lot of trouble. And I would never do that in a sermon. Uh, but if you've seen the TV show, Everyone Loves Raymond, let's go with that as the example. You'll know what I mean. It's a great TV show. It's family friendly, by, by and large. But Raymond, the main character, he has a mum. Mum is Marie. And her voice, Marie's voice, is a disruptive, annoying, persistent, unwelcome intrusion on the marriage. Raymond and his wife Deborah are always at odds. They're always in tension. And Deborah, well, she can't win anything whilst this unwelcome voice abounds. There's peace in the house until Marie enters in. And this is what it's like in our relationship to the law. Sin undermines everything. It unsettles us. It white ants us. It's the source of tension and wrestling, which we will explore a little bit more next week in the back end of chapter 7. What else is there to say about the law? Well, it shows us our condemnation as sinners. Verse 9. Verse 9. Can you see it? Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came... Sin sprang to life and I died. See? Didn't know what it was until someone told me and now, oh, guilty. Now, what does it mean that Paul was alive apart from the law? Let's explore that a little bit. Was he a child at the time? Didn't get the law, so he was, you know, none the wiser. Was he just ignorant of the law? Possible. Was he even naive of the law? Sounds like a staggering thing for a Pharisee, but... Is it true that the Pharisees, in the way they observed God's law, they were unaware and ignorant? As we read the Gospels, the answer has to be yes. They thought the law was an avenue of life. They thought it was the way to be right with God, but they are unaware. They're ignorant. They're naive. Maybe the story of the Good Samaritan is an example. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. You remember the opening question? posed by an expert in the law, comes to probe Jesus. What does he say? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The expert, expert in the law asked that question. He's just having a go, surely. And Jesus probes. He gives it back. Well, what does the law say? You're the expert. What does the law say? And the answer, of course, is, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, Big tick. Full marks, buddy. Off you go and you do it and you'll live. But the guy pauses because suddenly <laughs> he's been testing Jesus. Now he's got to justify himself, doesn't he? Because he was alive, thought he was. Now it seems to depend on one's, one's definition of neighbor now because he, you know, this is how it goes. Follow it. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God, love your neighbor. Yeah. Okay, go do it. Oh, I, do. I love God. Do I love my neighbor? Well, that depends on who my neighbor is, doesn't it? Suddenly, I mean, if you mean my wife, well, yeah, most of the time I try. Or, or okay, what, what, my children? Well, oh, yeah, sure, for the most part. Parents, again, for the most part. Well, okay, let's push it further. Brothers, sisters, cousins. Do you want me to keep going or should I stop? I could keep going. Does the expert in the law, does he want to stop? I mean, he's becoming a bit much. 
What if the boundary that defines neighbour is opened up to all and sundry? What hope would we have? Yeah, okay. You had me at wife or husband, right? Who is my neighbour? Jesus says, mate, you go out and you be a neighbour like the Samaritan, the bad guy. Go and be a neighbour like him who loved and was a neighbour without reference to colour, creed, race or anything. You go and love like that and then come and see me. See how unaware, naive and ignorant the expert in the law is. Or what about the rich young man in Luke 18, verse 18? Same question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, oh, what a surprise. He points him to the law. Jesus points him to the law. And the rich young man says, yeah, I've done all that. All these I've kept, right? See, he thinks he's alive. Like the expert in the law thought he was alive until, oh, maybe I'm not. But what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right, mate, so go out, rich young man. You kept the law? Well, go out and get rid of all your gold. You love me? Sell, sell everything. Love, sell everything. Give it away. You love your neighbour? Actually, when you give it away, you give it to the poor. How does that go? How does that go? How, how is his love for God and his neighbour at this point? Walk away from your riches. Follow me, says Jesus. Doesn't come at it, does he? I'm thinking he doesn't feel so alive anymore. See that he is naive and that he is ignorant. And see that it was true of the Pharisees and see that it was true of Paul as a Pharisee as well. He thought he was alive. Look at verse 10. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life brought death. There it is. It brought the opposite. Brothers and sisters, don't be naive. Don't be unaware. Don't be ignorant about the law. Don't trust in your ability or your merit or your strong moral code, or your reputation in the community, or your measure, your strange measure of self-righteousness. It's bogus. Yet so many of us keep seeing the law as an avenue of salvation, because I'm a good person, right? God will accept me because I've been good. But it doesn't work that way. Romans keeps telling us the opposite. That there is no one good, no one righteous, we are all lawbreakers. Friends, you'd be mad to be putting your trust in your morals or your values or your status or your perceived ability to keep the law. You're kidding yourself. No one is good as God is good. No one is righteous as God is righteous. We cannot keep the law's demand. And so we need to belong to another. We need to belong to Jesus. We need to trust in his performance of the law because only he did it. He did what I could never do and what you can never do. He lived the righteous life. Yet the righteous one, Jesus, the one who pulled it off, he died for the unrighteous, people like me and you, to bring us to God. That's what he did. And that is the gospel. And so we cling to the girth straps of Jesus. We cling to the girth straps of Jesus, not the law. Look at verse 11. For sin, the season, the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So this is, sounds like Genesis 3, doesn't it? The, the serpent that takes the word of God and twists them and takes advantage of them and goads Adam and Eve to rebel against God. And this is what sin does perpetually with God's law. It sucks us into rebellion and condemnation and death. And so make no mistake, verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy 
and righteous and good. And so, okay, question again, verse 13, did that which is good then become death to me? No. But it is how we know what sin is. Sin can be recognized as sin. It takes what is good and it brings about my death. And so the law is good because it shows me who I am before God. It declares me to be utterly sinful, alienated from God, on a path to eternal death and hell. It opens my eyes. So that I can now see. It opens my eyes that I can see my need for a saviour. The one we call Jesus. The law says, Drake, you are a great sinner. But it points me forward to the one who is an even greater saviour. And so with the Apostle Paul, I can share with him And declare, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body that is subject to death? Well, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can say that together. Closing questions. With the law in its right place, do we seek to honour the law as did our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we love God? By that I mean, are we loving God and loving our neighbour? Do we understand the implications? Are we honouring our parents? Uh, We might not be guilty of murder, but are we checking anger? Are we coveting? Adultery? Theft? How often do we look at the law and do this reality check? And by that I mean, how often do we realise the extent of our own sinfulness, but then having become convicted of our sinfulness, Do we then taste the gospel of grace again and again and again? Do we taste the Lord and see that he is good and realize the greatness of the rescue that we have in Christ Jesus? Do we do that? And then are we able to join with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who declare with great praise, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. My Lord. Trust is fine.